a lady from St. Louis County on Sicker District. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. So I have a few questions. Um, I want to go back to when a child is released from jurisdiction, first of all. Um, who makes that decision to release the child from jurisdiction? The court. The court makes that decision. Yes. Um, who requests that? Um, it could be requested from different parties. It could be a petition by Children's Division. It could be a but the juvenile office, it could be the guardian ad litem. I mean, there could be different requesters. Different parties of the case could make that request. What is the policy around children's division making that request? I think it would be, I mean, I think it's case specific. I mean, we have talked about situations where, and it's talked a little bit about the, it um, in that the last finding in the OIG report where it talks about wanting us to differentiate between kids on the run and kids who are in um, unapproved placements because right now and and for and another example would be kids who have been kidnapped because I can tell you on our run list right now we have kids that are their parental kidnappings um, we have kids that are truly on run and then we have kids that um, are in unapproved placements and um, for example our policy should be if we have a kid in an unapproved placement there is no way for us to assure safety of that child. So we have a kid on run, and we find out they're with a bio parent, um, they're with a boyfriend's family sleeping on a couch or whatever. We can't assure safety. So if if we can't get them back in, um, because sometimes we just have phone contacts. We don't really know where they are, but they're telling us that they're safe. You know, one of two things, or if we know where they are, one of two things should happen when we have an unaccompanied or, or, or a child who is um, in an unapproved placement. We should petition the court for release of jurisdiction because we don't have any, we don't have any ability to ensure safety of that child. There's no way for us to ensure safety. Um, or we make a request of the court to court order wherever the child is, the youth is, into that placement. Um, and so, for example, but, but re release of jurisdiction, for example, would be when it's like we, you know, either we know where the child is and we, there's no way for us to, um, to get the child back, we might request release of jurisdiction because we can't do our job. We can't, we can't do the things that are required of us by law or another reason for release of jurisdiction. Maybe we don't know where they are, but thinking about if they're over, if they're 18 or over and they're able-bodied and they're able mind to release, release of jurisdiction because at some point, they have, they're making a decision as to whether or not they want to be in care. And that decision when they've ran um, seems to be, we know what that is. So, but it is case by case specific um, and the courts respond to those in different ways. So is any safety plan made for these children when they're released from care? We don't have any involvement with a, a child when they're released from care. Um, there are for example, with, um, with, with stimulus money or, or money coming from the federal government, there are some, there are some uh, funding streams that we have to be able to support them uh, financially right now um, up to age 21. And then also they would get Medicaid um, until age 26. But um, we don't have any kind of a mentorship or program that would, um, would work with them after uh, release of jurisdiction. They show, um, and of course in Missouri, um, kids can choose to remain in foster care until age 21. It's at their discretion from that 18 to 21, but they can choose to remain in the system if, if they want to for those supports. Okay. Um, you mentioned the change made to the case management system so that, because right now everybody who goes missing is in run status, whether they're kidnapped or run, have run away or if they're living in an unapproved placement. Have you made requests to change that? Um, a request was put in just for that specific piece to help differentiate between the situations when a child is on that run list. You know, ki unapproved placement, kidnapping, truly on run, don't know where it is. Um, that um, we received a cost estimate and the level of effort from ITSD with that, and that has been pending since then because of budget constraints and competing priorities. Okay, what was the cost estimate for that? Um, 90,000. 90,000. 
I understand that um, you had that the department had a few a couple million dollars lapse just from the children's field staff operations last year. Um, so why was that not prioritized if the money lapsed? I think part of the, when we budget and, and represent, I have to go back and look at that lapse mm -hmm. um, because I'm not familiar with that lapse. But I think if there was cash to support that appropriation authority, I mean, part of it is for this $90,000 plan, we may have to know that six months in advance to be able to get it paid by that time. So I, I, we'll go back and look at the lapse. We'll also go back because I think with the estimate, we'd have a time frame for when that piece would be required to be implemented. So, you know, if we look at something and say, well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to have $90,000 January 1, but to get it paid in that fiscal year, we have to start at January 1. Um, it, that could be a prohibition against okay. starting so it. So there's budgetary constraints. Have you made a request in the 2023 budget for this as a new decision item? I'm, I think that some of what she was referring to, because when this was kind of the minimum that, w that at that time we could do, ideally, everything on our policy that's required, both federally, statutorily policy, would be in our system. That is a much larger cost. Um, and in our system in the sense that if they enter run there, it's almost like a forced enter, then you have to put those details, um, which we haven't priced out. And I, I believe that's what we're looking for. If we're taking a step back and looking at a new case management solution, you know, solution as a whole, that would be something we would require. Because what I hear is to really tell that story and document our efforts, it needs to be in that system. So we have a bunch of money from fe the federal stimulus from, for COVID relief. Um, ha has any request been put in for this system update? make a request in our October budget for a system update or a new system, but it is something that we're working on um, with the with the um, with the CIO with Jeff Wan, and um, I, I would hope that we would be able to have something um, in uh, the the governor's recommendations. But that's not my decision to make. But it is something that we're actively working on. So we should expect to see that in the governor's recommendations. Well, I can't. I, I don't get to decide what's in the governor's recommendations and what's not. I can but, raise that as something that is important to us and we would like to see funded. Um, but I can't make that decision. So you have made that request to the governor's office. We have we have worked through that with OA budget and planning, and we are working through details on what that would look like. With um, and I have told the governor's office is something that we're interested in pursuing. Um, okay, I want to go back to, you were talking about documentation. So if a nurse goes in and takes the blood pressure and takes a patient's temperature and it's not documented, not documented in the file, somebody else, the next person in the room will see that wasn't done and do it. So um, these safety and health checks for, that were supposed to happen once a child was returned to care, why didn't somebody follow up and do those? Or is it your testimony today that those were done and not documented? I think it could be either or. I, the, the answer is I don't know. I mean, I, if, since they're not in the case record, and we've talked about this before, like, like, like I don't know if they happen or not. Um, I think one of the things that we've been talking to um, local leadership about is what is the supervisor's role? Um, in this because there are supervisors and, you know, their, their case ratio um, is, um, I mean, the requirement is, is one to six and um, we're actually a little better than that, I think, or close to that. So I don't think that we have supervisors that are caring. Now, if you, if you even it out, like mathematically, there are probably some that would say, would come to you and say, well, absolutely not. Like I'm carrying 20, you know, I have 20 workers, but, um, but, um, you know, I think that's one of the things we're stepping back and looking at and thinking about is what is the, um, you know, what is the role in the supervisor in ensuring documentation. One of the other things, we haven't talked a lot about the policy that we put in place around this. And again, it's another example of a checklist that, you know, people don't like checklists, but when we're not complying with 
federal and, and, and state law, like I, I have to figure out some way. So we, we've implemented um, a checklist as part of the, you know, when you have a child on run and we have some responsibility and we're, we're, we have a structure. So we're standardizing that checklist. We had let um, um, regions do their different checklists. We found best practice again in the Southeast part of the state. So we are going to standardize the checklist and set some requirements around having one contact in that region who's responsible for reaching out and working with supervisors and um, our caseworkers to make sure that this is actually happening. And um, I will have our, um, in, we have internal auditors in our finance administrative division and we'll actually be going out and auditing that process as an, um, just to make sure that it's happening. So, um, you know, back to your question on how could it not happen, you know, if you had some checks and balances, I would say that the supervisor would be the next um, individual who would have looked at that case. But um, we're going to put some checks and balances in place um, that are consistent throughout the state and um, at, frankly, a higher level. Of the, you know, the number of kids on run, um, you know, it's something that, um, you know, I, I question, it's probably not something that happens frequently in a caseload. So sometimes I question why um, a worker wouldn't have, you know, asked more questions about what needed to happen in that process because it isn't something that you see all the time, but that's why we just want to give back to support to the workers. We want to give so some support to the workers um, once that, that kid is placed and run so that we can make sure that we are going through the things that the OIG has said that, um, that we needed to do and that we hadn't documented that we had done in these cases. Is that the kind of thing Accenture is going to be looking at in their, um, in their evaluation, in their program evaluation? The checklists and making sure things are done according to law? Um, Accenture's is more of the staffing and kind of caseload review. We are taking a look at our process improvement um, and our ability um, to streamline, provide the tools necessary to capture the information that is we need and is required um, and give those, give that capacity to our staff. And that Accenture ex evaluation, how much is that costing the state? Um, I'd have to go back and get that. I haven't looked at it recently. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Um, I'd appreciate that information. And I'm also curious um, how many bids there were on that contract. And then the last question I have is visitation plans. Um, why are there some kids without visitation plans with their families? Um, I think that goes back to, um, I'm not saying that it's not, I'm saying it's not in the system of, or it wasn't in the system of record at this time. Are so, there any children now who do not have visitation plans with their, with their biological parents? Um, I mean, all of them, I mean, that's policy that should, I'd have to review all of our cases to do so. Um, I can follow up on the best way to provide that information to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative.